Did you ever get a ticket for talking on a cell phone while driving? You gotta be shitting me, I said. That's what this is all about? Yep, he said. One afternoon, I was driving my Porsche through the city, talking on the phone. The seatbelt cops hid behind trucks and vans next to traffic lights, looking for drivers and passengers without seatbelts on. They caught me on the phone. I had forgotten to pay the ticket, and they issued a bench warrant. But they never come looking for you. They usually just wait until you get stopped again. And when they ran your name through the system, they see that you had a warrant. The Hip Hop Task Force must have been investigating my criminal history and used the warrant as an excuse to come get me. The task force is known for racial profiling. Even though the D's who arrested me were black, they were only following orders from their white superiors. They actually came looking for me like I was America's most wanted for talking on a cell phone while driving. Do they have a country music task force? And why not? Those redneck shit kickers are probably some of the biggest gun runners, gun holders, and coke dealers around. You think not? Why? Because they're white? The world is so racist, it's a shame. The judge released me with time served. No fine, no bail, case closed. I walked more than 35 blocks from the tombs down by Wall Street to Alchemist's crib and took a two-hour nap on his couch. I woke up, washed up, and bounced because we were leaving for the U.S. tour that night. The Blood Money tour was an amazing time. Ever since seeing Naughty by Nature's stage set at an Apollo concert in the early 90s, I wanted to do something similar but better. What if we had a stage set built like the projects, I imagine? Back when we were planning the America's Nightmare tour, I met with a guy named Snow who built stage sets and wanted $20,000 to create my vision. Jive didn't want to give us the budget, so it didn't happen. But 50 loved the idea, and we hired two guys from the G-Unit crew to assemble and pack away the set which took about an hour on each end. Every night, we came out the front door of the project building at the beginning of each show. One of our first stops on the tour was an appearance at a small store in Baltimore with people lined up around the block waiting for an autograph. Dudes who looked like they hadn't changed their clothes in years and kids looking like they didn't have a dollar to their name were online to buy our CD. Meanwhile, I had on tons of jewelry. For the first time in our career, I felt guilty. It was time to truly make a change in how I carried myself and spent my money. Prodigy and Mob Deep represent the hood. We represent poverty. I felt as though I was rubbing my money and fame in their faces. Baltimore is one of the most poverty-stricken, drug and crime-infested hoods on the map running neck and neck with D.C., Detroit, and Louisiana. Touring the world all those years had given me the opportunity to witness poverty all over the planet. England, France, Russia, India, all the way back to the U.S. Poverty creates criminal thinking and actions. I was seeing things with new eyes. Speaking with kids at a juvenile detention center in Atlanta, was one of the highlights of the tour. There were 10 year olds locked up for murder and all kinds of wild shit. It felt good to share our experiences with them. The detention center awarded Havoc and me with a plaque showing their appreciation. In Los Angeles, we had a show at the House of Blues on Sunset and stayed at the hotel directly across the street. Earlier that day, Accompanied by our G-Unit radio rep, Nelson, and our Interscope radio rep, Adam Favors, we did a radio show at Power 106 with DJ Felly Fell. Felly asked us how it felt to be on G-Unit with 50 Cent. Man, it's great, man. 50 is the best, I responded. For our signing bonus, he bought us Porsches, 
and gave us 20% of the game's publishing. So anytime that game makes a hit record, that's a new house for us. So I wish game nothing but success. It's making us rich. I was just popping shit. It wasn't true. I was just saying shit to get game pissed off because he was dissing G-Unit on a lot of songs. You should have seen the look on Felly Fell, Nelson, and Adam's faces. Felly Fell changed the subject real quick. I hope you got an army and a navy outside waiting for us, Nelson said after the interview. Adam Favors started making all kinds of phone calls in a panic. It was funny. We didn't have to call armies and navies. Trust, we had it covered. I was relaxing and writing rhymes in my hotel room before getting ready for the concert when 40 Glock knocked on the door. Yo, the game is outside in front of the hotel with some basketball dude, he said. We got the drop on him. He doesn't even know we here in his hotel. What you want to do? 40 pulled out a 45 caliber pistol and continued. He saw Nice with the Mob Deep Game Over shirt and got spooked, cuz. My man Maniac walked over to him and offered him a one-on-one fight. He still out there right now? I asked. Yeah, cuz. We spit lungies all over his Bentley, Forty said. Look over the balcony, cuz. And give me the gun, I said. Y'all niggas put the video camera on game. I'm gonna shoot the gun off the balcony and we catch him on camera ducking and running from the shots. Cuz, you tripping. We on sunset, Forty said. You know how fast police will be here? Look, I'm not going to shoot him. I'm going to shoot in the air so we can get him on camera scared to death, I said. The gun will be long gone before the police get here. Nah, cuz, you're going to make this shit hotter than fish grease, Forty said. Let's just go beat his ass. Okay, I'll meet you in Harry's room in five minutes. After I got dressed... I went to Hav's room and told him what I wanted to do. No, you bugging, P, Hav said. I'm going to go down and talk to him. Real men talk things out. What? There's nothing to talk about, I said. Man, fuck talking. Real men talk things out, Hav repeated. I knew what Hav meant. Of course men can talk, but in this situation, I didn't agree at all. There was nothing to talk about. Game had been running his mouth about Junior and Mob Deep ever since 50 dropped him and signed us. So I wanted to do something about it. Yo, guess what, cuz? Forty said about five minutes later. I just got off the phone with one of my blood homies, and he said Game called him saying, Yo, Mob Deep is on Sunset. Come over here and let's show these niggas how Cali gets down. My blood homie said he's in the car with Suge right now, and they've been looking for game for a while now. They said they're going to rob game when they get here. This was getting good. Meanwhile, Havoc wanted to talk it out. He was being smart and trying to stay out of trouble. Havoc would get busy if his back was to the wall, but he saw that it wasn't that serious. He was right, and I was wrong, but I didn't see it at that time. I was a natural-born troublemaker, it excited me. Hey, I'm sorry if you can't relate. That's just me. That's the same reason why I'm writing this book from a solitary confinement prison cell in Mid-State Correctional Facility. Suge Knight and 40's homeboy pulled up in a red GT Bentley. Our niggas had games around it, his car covered in spit. Then, somebody from the hotel front desk must have called the police. As soon as the police pulled up, Game got in his spit riddle Bentley and bounced. Suge did the same. Damn, I wanted to see some action. The morning after the House of Blues show, we headed to San Diego. R&B singer Keisha Cole was working on her second album and looking for beats. Keisha's people sent Havoc a number to contact her. In the back of the tour bus, Hav was tipsy. I couldn't tell if it was from the night before or that morning. He called the number. What's up? This is Havoc. I heard you working on your new album. You know I got that fire for you. But to tell you the truth, I don't want to talk about music right now. I'm trying to holler at you. 
So on some real shit, if you want to talk about music, then you might as well just hang up right now. Oh, no. Why did he just say that? I asked myself. I couldn't hear what Keisha said back to him, but I could tell from Havy's response that it wasn't good. What? You know my man P already? Oh, yeah? Then he looked at me in shock. I was confused at first, thinking, I know her? Damn. Did I bag her back in the day? Then it hit me. Keisha from the Beverly Center Mall. Oh, shit. I bagged Keisha Cole before she became famous. Have immediately ruined his opportunity to produce for her. Keisha hung up on him. You know her, son? She said she knows you, he said. Yeah, yeah, I bagged her a couple of years ago in the Beverly Center. I didn't realize it was Keisha. It was before she blew up, I said. Damn, son, you just fucked that relationship up. You could have sold her some beats. I had was too bent and brushed it off. Keisha, if you reading this, I apologize for all that nonsense. At the cover in most of the U.S., we toured overseas in London and Paris as usual. Then made the trek to Australia and New Zealand for the first time with a connecting flight in Tahiti. In a car on the way to the hotel in New Zealand, my vision suddenly went from blurry to black. By the time we got to the hotel, I was totally blind, only seeing bright lights. I had just seen the movie Ray starring Jamie Foxx and thought I had suddenly lost my sight like Ray Charles did as a kid. I was scared to death. The hotel called an eye doctor. Do you have any medical problems? The doctor asked after examining my eyes. I told him I had sickle cell anemia. Okay, 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 I know what's wrong. You have sickle cell retinitis. He explained that the high altitude of the long airplane flights decreased the oxygen level in my blood, causing blood vessels to burst in my retinas. After using eye drops, my vision slowly started to come back five hours later. Man, it felt good to see my ugly ass niggas again. <laughs> After New Zealand, we flew to Japan. As soon as the promoters picked us up from the airport, the first thing Alchemist and I asked was, where's the weed at? The hotel was plush, but the rooms were tiny and the beds even tinier. The toilet seats had buttons that made them heat up. Hey, I guess nobody likes a cold toilet seat. At the show, they didn't have the correct equipment for us to perform. So we only did two songs on a mic with the cord. But there were so many good looking Japanese girls, dime after dime. The after party at our hotel was the stuff that dreams are made of. Japanese women get right down to business and aim to please. We flew to New York and rested during a short break before heading back overseas to Chile, India, Hong Kong, and England one more time. I'd ordered a bulletproof Chevy Suburban from the same company that 50 Yayo and Banks had gotten theirs from. It was waiting for me when I pulled up to my house. The truck cost $120,000 and was worth every penny. The windows could stop an AK-47 and the rest of the truck was completely armored with about five inches of steel. It's bomb-proof, and the tires will run flat, which meant that if they were shot, the truck could still drive. Now that we were a part of G-Unit, I knew that the jealous and envious bullshit would surface more than ever before. Look what happened in Tupac, Biggie, Stretch, E-Money Bags, and 50. It's better to prevent a situation than to try to cure the outcome. Kiki and I moved into an exclusive waterfront townhouse in a gated community in Secaucus, New Jersey, just five minutes from Manhattan. Giants Stadium was directly across the water, and a lot of the Giants football players lived in the community. Corey Webster was our next-door neighbor. You crazy for moving your woman around all those NFL players, Avic told me. I wouldn't do that shit. 
But it didn't matter if you moved to no man's land. If a person want to cheat, they're going to find a way. I got another offer to co-star in an independent film. This one was called Blackout, starring Zoe Saldana and Jeffrey Wright. Since I was a kid watching the making of Michael Jackson's Thriller, I had always been intrigued with the craft of movie making. I also started writing this book around the time of that movie offer. Kiki was writing a book about her life story and inspired me to do the same. Sitting in our new townhouse in New Jersey, I'd stay up all night typing on my laptop. I figured it would make for one hell of a read. After our short break, I'd stay back up to the all night tour. typing on my laptop. Our first stop was London. At the after party, DJ Who Kid was talking to this good-looking white girl who kept checking me out. When she sat back down with her girlfriends, I walked over. We kicked it for about 20 minutes and I got her phone number. She told me she was from Long Island, but lived in Los Angeles. Who kid walked over after she left? Yo, you know who that was? He said. No, why? Who is she? Lindsay Lohan, he said. Lindsay who? I asked. Who's that? She's an actress, nigga, he said, laughing. Did you get her number? Yeah, I didn't know who she was. I may have heard her name once or twice, but I really didn't know who she was. We caught a flight to Chile, our next concert stop, with 40 Glock, Sam Scarfo, two G-Unit role managers, and DJ On Point. 40 minutes into the flight, I was playing Miami Vice on my son Shaka's PlayStation Portable when the flight got bumpy. 40 Glock walked into the first class section where Havoc and I were sitting at and said, Yo, cuz, the plane is on fire, cuz. The engine just blew up. My heart almost jumped out my chest. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain calm, the captain said over the loudspeaker. We're going to have to turn back around and make an emergency landing. We lost power in one of our engines. The engine was burning on the right side of the plane. Have it gripped the armrest. We lost power the turbulence our made the flight feel like a full-fledged roller coaster ride. I just kept playing Miami Vice. I'm definitely not going to die on the airplane, I said to myself. I got a lot more work to do out in the world, and I know that the Most High is actually carrying this plane and will set it down safely in our destination. After landing... We rushed to an airport bar for some drinks to calm our nerves. The concert in Chile was canceled, and we flew out the next day to Bombay for our first performance in India. No other American rappers ever performed in India. Mob Deep was the first. Ten hours into the 18-hour flight, my sickle cell pain started creeping up. By the time the flight landed in Bombay, I was in bad shape. India is extremely poverty-stricken, and we had on all kinds of jewelry, so people looked at us like we were insane. Cows, considered sacred in India, roamed freely in the streets, and the beaches were overpopulated with fully-dressed people. The Marriott Hotel was the most modern structure. Everything else looked like squalor. After checking into our rooms, 40 Glock, Sam Scarfo, and our security guard house and I went to the hotel restaurant and ordered some curry chicken. Everything had curry in it out there. I was trying not to think about the pain I was feeling. Mind over matter, just relax, I kept telling myself, as House reminisced on club fight stories from the 90s. P, I remember when TLC had the party at Rosalind Ballroom in Manhattan. I saw you and your boys walk in, and ten minutes later, y'all got into a fight and shut the whole party down. You remember that? Oh, wow. You was there for that? I said, small world. After eating, the moment I feared finally approached. I had to go to the hospital.
I was fighting tears with severe pain pounding all over my body as I was wheeled into the hospital in a wheelchair. The Indian doctors broke the bad news that pain medication, IV tubing, and saline solution bags were illegal in India. The doctors seemed very knowledgeable. The only problem was they had none of the necessary supplies to treat me. A doctor pulled my man Reed from G-Unit to the side and told him, I know you can buy all these things he needs. You have to take the train and taxi two hours to buy these supplies off the black market. The doctor wrote down instructions, like sending Reed on an Indiana Jones mission to find the lost Ark of the Covenant. I was wheeled on a stretcher into a back room that I thought I would die in. Slowly, I felt the sicker cells accumulating and spreading throughout my body. Then I felt something that I never felt before. The sicker cells started moving to my heart. It was time to put an emergency call to the most high. I know you're not going to let me die like this. You better not let me die like this. Please don't let me die like this. All the dangerous shit I've been through, don't let sicker cell take me out. I've experienced pain so incredible that it made me laugh. And laughter so joyous that it made me cry. When you experience the paramount of those feelings, you learn that they're actually one and the same. My pain became so great in that rusty old Bombay hospital that I laughed out loud, delirious. Then something strange happened. All of a sudden, it felt like all my dead friends and relatives were in the room with me. I couldn't see them, but I sensed their presence. Grandmoms, my grandfather, Pops, Scarface Twin, Killer Black, Yammy, E-Money Bags. I spoke to all of them out loud, asking for help. I wanted to live. A few minutes later, the pain in my heart was gone. I thanked them and the Most High. Reed made it back with morphine pills in a Ziploc bag, and then the doctors hooked me up to the black market IV tubing. I missed the Bombay concert. Havoc, 40 Glock, and Sam Scarfo performed without me. We booked a flight home the next morning, and I checked into Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. Havoc was mad that I couldn't make it to our concert out in Hong Kong, but my body needed to heal. It seemed that all Havoc cared about was the money because he was really upset with me for refusing to go. When I think about it now, he had the right to be upset. If I'd have been taking better care of my health, I wouldn't have missed the concert. After I healed, I came up with an idea to record a solo mix CD to prepare the world for my next solo album, H&IC Part 2. Alchemist and I traded ideas. I came up with the name Return of the Mac, as in a person coming back for revenge with a Mac-10 gun. Al came up with all sorts of samples from black 70s movies, because our plan was to give the whole mix CD a retro feel, like the soundtrack to an old flick. While we were busy recording, Lloyd Banks released his second solo album, Rotten Apple. The album was hot, but a lot of people hated on it like they hated on Blood Money. It was obvious that a lot of people wanted to see G when it fell. Or was it that maybe we were just too arrogant to realize our own creative faults? Chapter 13 Return of the Mac Hey yo, the hood broke my heart into pieces. Done these streets, took my dreams and shattered them. And turned me to a creature, monster money. Got me not giving a fuck. All I care about is music and who I gotta cut with the Mac Uzi 47. Pick a weapon, a million ways to die. My two father ended. Bang on him. Summer of 2006, Brooklyn, New York. I began filming an independent movie, Blackout, out in Flatbush. 
my role didn't have too many lines. So the director, Jerry Lamoff, told me to improvise. The second day on set, I shot a scene with Jeffrey Wright, who was one of my favorite actors. After filming rap, I connected with 50 Cent's video director, Dan the Man, to shoot a paranoid, psychotic, grimy video for my mix CD song, Mac 10 Handle. Bloody couch and mirror stabbings, hallucinations of Satan, and some guy in a Michael Myers mask. No jury, no half-naked females, no fashion show. The video was an overnight success on the internet, with over 400,000 views in three days. It was completely against the grain. I wanted to show 50 my work ethic and how I could create a huge buzz on my own. I was trying to spark his interest in signing me as a solo artist and releasing HNIC Part 2 under the G-Unit brand. But before I stepped to him with the idea, I wanted to show him what I can do. I always had a complex about my teeth. I didn't smile in pictures or in front of females because I had a slight gap between my two front teeth. And after so many years of smoking cigarettes and weed, my teeth were stained yellow. Plus, I had two pointed incisors that looked like fangs on either side of my front teeth. I believed that those sharp pointed teeth were a trait from my mom's side of the family because many Caucasians have those two sharp pointed fangs. One day, when I get enough money, I'm going to fix my teeth and I'm going to have a pearly white Hollywood smile, I tell Kiki. Yes, please, she say. I love you and all, but damn. While Havoc and I were enjoying the success of the infamous in 1995, I found out from Twin and Draws that Nas had a nickname for me that he used behind my back. He and his boys called me Rat Boy because my two front teeth looked like a rat's. It was funny, but deep down, it made my complex worse. So after shooting the Mac 10 handle video, I asked Kiki to find an oral surgeon who could give me a beautiful smile. Kiki set up an appointment with Dr. Rizzo, whose office was five minutes from my New Jersey townhouse. If it's one thing that I was a punk about, it was going to the dentist. Needles in my mouth, drilling, root canals, pfft, fuck all that. But one month and $20,000 later, I looked like a new man. Smiling every chance that I got. It was the best 20000 I ever spent in my life. To all the fellas who are listening to this, and all the rap boys across the map, fight back. Fix your jibs instead of wasting your money on foolishness. And Nas, thank you. You inspired me once again to be all I could be. <laughs> Love you, boy. Right after I got my pearly whites, 50 called a meeting at his office for the entire G-Unit roster. When Havoc and I showed up, Olivia was there, along with Banks, Yayo, MOP's manager, and Young Buck was on the speakerphone. Mace never signed to the label because Puffy was asking for too much money to buy him out his existing bad boy contract. 50 started the meeting. I called this meeting today because I want to let y'all know that I've been spending a lot of money to promote you all on tour and several other expenses. And I haven't been seeing a profit on a lot of my investments, 50 said. Plus, I heard that some of y'all ain't happy. Then he turned to Olivia. For starters, I spent all kinds of money on your hairstylist, makeup artist, stylist, studio time, and I don't see you making any hits for a good album. Olivia tried to make excuses, but they weren't good enough. 50 then turned to M.O.P.'s manager. And as far as M.O.P., I got y'all up in my house studio for several months, and I don't see any work being done. Mob Deep did over 40 songs within a few weeks before we even inked the deal. It's been almost a year and I haven't seen any effort from you guys. M.O.P.'s manager tried to make excuses, 
what they weren't good enough. Then he turned to Banks. And I don't know what your problem is. You got the work ethic. You make good songs. But you act like you don't want to do the promotional work it takes to sell the album correctly. Now, I know you had some personal issues with your family lately. But I lost my mom's banks. I know what it feels like to lose a family member. That didn't stop me from doing what needed to be done, though. Banks had recently lost his father and was mourning, so he probably hadn't done a lot of the necessary promo. I started to feel uncomfortable listening to the discussion between 50 and Banks. It sounded personal, and I felt like it was none of Mob Deep's business. But 50 obviously wanted us to hear it. I heard you're upset with your album sales, 50 continued. Well, I got on songs for all of your albums. I wrote choruses, got in the videos. It's up to y'all to lyrically perform at your best and do the work it takes to market and promote the projects. I'm not going to do it all for you. As a matter of fact, I'm not doing any more features on any of y'all songs or videos because I'm carrying all the weight. Y'all have to start pulling your own weight. Yo, Buck, you there? You heard what I said? Buck mumbled through the speakerphone. Buck said. I got hits on this album. We good. That was some real disrespectful, cocky shit he just said. I thought to myself, what is he trying to say that? His shit is better than 50 Cent, Mob Deep, Yeo and Banks? Buck used the wrong choice of words as far as I was concerned. Then 50 continued. Yeo was locked up and his album was on hold until he got out. He missed a lot of big promotion while he was gone, but he did what he had to do when he got home. Yayo cut in and said, I'm not complaining about album sales, man. I'm good. Whatever needs to be done, I'm doing it. And 50 said, Look at what P just did with his video on the internet. He shot a video for a mix CD song on his own. He's not waiting for me to help him. He's pushing himself, making himself hot. Niggas need to be doing shit like that. Then Banks came out of left field and said, What? This meeting is all about me? Because you seem to be focused on me the most. No, it's not all about you, 50 said. I'm talking to everybody. But you need to start doing your promo work before you start complaining about your album sales. I want everybody in here to look down under the table and tell me what you see. Everybody looked under the table, confused. I don't see nobody rocking G-Unit sneakers, 50 said. I see Gucci, Louie, Fendi, Timberland, but I pay you endorsement checks every month to wear G-Unit. 50 made that endorsement deal with Yayo, Banks, Buck, and maybe Olivia before Mob Deep came around. We weren't a part of that deal, so he wasn't talking to us. From now on, I'm dead in that deal, and you won't get your checks anymore, 50 told them. So y'all can forget about that. Wow, I thought. If 50 would have gave us that deal, I would have worn G-Unit to sleep at night, and in my casket. Buck mumbled over the phone once more. I got this, 50. Me and Spider Lope, we going hard. I'm the cleanup man, trust me. Buck needed to shut the fuck up and listen to what was being said. He needed to hand in a good album instead of talking all that cleanup man shit. This nigga frontin', Banks jumped up and said. He ain't happy. Ain't nobody happy with this label. Banks slammed his fitted hat on the table and sat back in his chair. Oh yeah? 50 looked at Banks and said. You wanna bounce like game and start your own label? I got you. I call my lawyer and tell him to get you a deal over at Geffen, and you could do your own thing from now on. Banks stormed out the meeting. A week later, 50 dropped Olivia and M.O.P. from the label. I wanted to ask 50 to put H&IC Part 2 out on G-Unit, but after that meeting, I didn't feel right about asking him. I didn't want to get shot down or put him in an awkward position by having to tell me he wasn't interested in doing my solo album. 
so I kept it to myself for the time being. When 50 acknowledged that he liked what I was doing with my mix CD video, it added fuel to my already existing fire. Alchemist and I finished Return of the Mac, and I plan to release it through DJ Who Kid as a street mix CD for free. But then I got a call from Bob Perry, who'd been missing in action since Free Agents, and was now working with Koch Records, offering $200,000 to buy Return of the Mac. I took that paper. 200000 up front and one check, and I ran. When I told 50 how much I got from my mix CD, he was like, Wow, how the hell did you pull that off? That's good. After I got that money, I shot three more videos for the mix CD, Stuck to You, New York Shit, and Seventh Heaven, featuring Un Pacino, a rapper from Ocean Village Projects in Far Rockaway, Queens, whom I had met through Twin. I released the videos one at a time, every few weeks. The buzz was strong for Return of the Mac, and the press gave rave reviews for the Mac 10 handle video. So Koch was ready to release the mix CD immediately. Alchemist and I did a photo shoot for the CD artwork, wearing classic mafia-style suits. I came up with the nicknames for Alchemist and myself, Bumpy Johnson and Dutch Schultz. Old-time Harlem gangsters who went by the same names. Harlem rapper Cameron had been enjoying a successful run with his group The Diplomats, a.k.a. Dipset. They dropped a bunch of hits on Jay-Z's Rockefeller Records, and the crew had two rising solo artists, Jewel Santana and Jim Jones. Right before Return of the Mac was released, Jim Jones put out a hit single titled Ballin'. Jewel Santana and Jim Jones were both on Koch Records, so we were label mates. Alchemist was also signed to Koch. Return of the Mac was released and sold about 50,000 units, just what I needed to get my buzz going for HNIC Part 2. A month later, I got a call from a dude named Scientific, whom San Scarfo introduced me to, telling me about this company, Voxonic, that wanted to start a record label. Voxonic had a patent for some type of new voice translation technology where they could take song lyrics and translate them into any language. He said that they were looking to promote the new technology through a record label, but didn't have any experience with the music industry and needed artists and somebody to help run the label. I told Scientific to set up a meeting with the owner so I could find out if it was worth my time. Later that day, Twin called and said that he, Godfather, and Ty Nitty were about to shoot a video for a song we did for a European compilation album. Twin said that the company gave him $5,000 cash for me to appear in the video, and he had the cash on him. Kiki and I bounced to Queensbridge where the video was being shot in front of Havoc's old building. I parked a bulletproof Suburban on 21st Street and then walked over to meet everybody. On the block, I saw friendly faces that I hadn't seen in years. Yo, what up, that? My man Bumpy greeted me. The last time I saw Bump was when he had Worm on the back of his BMX bike and Worm shot his gun in the air trying to scare me. <laughs> Bumpy got locked up after that and did like six years. I shot my scenes real quick because Kiki was waiting for me in the truck. She's not very sociable with people and doesn't trust anybody, so she fell back. While Twin, Bumpy, and Godfather walked with me back to my car, we saw Green Eyes walking towards us on 21st Street. I hadn't seen him since I stopped dealing with bars and hooks. Yo, P, I need to speak with you real fast. What up, man? He said. We stepped aside. What's the word, man? I asked. Look, the nigga Preem is upset with you because you've been talking about him on your songs, Green Eye said. He has some niggas out here looking for you. I already told niggas that they gotta fall back because you my nigga, P. But just stop talking about all that shit in your songs. While Green Eyes was talking, Bumpy and Twin walked over. You good, Dan? You good, P? Bumpy asked. 
What up with this nigga right here? Yeah, it's all good, I said. We good. All right. Just let me know, because anybody front on you, Dunn, niggas going to get fucked up out here. Then Twin said, Yo, you good, P? You sure? Yeah, we just talking. Chill, I said. Then they backed up. Green Eyes then said, Yo, you my nigga, P. You know I love you, man. Preem just feel like it's none of your business. So just leave all that shit alone, man. I'm out here, man. I'll see you later on. I gave him a pound and then he left. Green Eyes was referring to my song, Rotten Apple, on Return of the Mac, where I got a line saying, If Pac was still alive, we'd be on the same team. We got bigger fish to fry than that bitch Supreme. I was referring to Tupac's relationship with E Money Bags and Majesty and how that would have eventually made us friends. I called Primo bitch because he had E Money Bags killed and got 50 shot up. So fuck Prem, simply put. You send niggas, I send them back in plastic. You send bitches, I send bitches back pregnant. Simply put. Godfather told me one day that some Supreme Team niggas was walking around the projects asking about me, saying they were going to kill me. But I didn't know what he was talking about and didn't care. Now Green Eyes confirmed it. Oh well, see me when you see me, nigga. Twin gave me my $5,000 and Kiki and I left. My relationship with Kiki was getting a little better. After I caught those cheating messages on the phone, I became real cold-hearted. The G-Unit deal only made me worse. She probably thought I was cheating a lot. But 99% of the time, I was just working on music and kicking it with my boys. I'd rather chase money. I spent long hours in the studio and came home around 5 a.m. every day ever since Kiki and I was first together. It was a rare occasion for me to take a break, and a vacation was out of the question. Vacation? What's that? Working so hard, I was missing out on time with my kids and my woman. I used to bring my son Shaka with me to the studio in the office back when he was three years old, until 2002, when I started smoking and bullshitting again. I didn't want him around all that. Scientific hit me back and told me Voxonic offered to give me a 50-50 deal with a $400,000 advance and ownership of my masters. Vox also offered an ownership percentage of the company as well and an executive position at the label with a $5,000 per month salary and fully paid living expenses, which is worth an additional $5,000 per month. I told 50 about it and he said, Yo, how the hell do you be making all these crazy deals? That's amazing. Take it. Looking over a rough contract, Mob Deep's new lawyer, Evan Freifeld, had the same response as 50. He couldn't believe it. Evan wanted to make minor adjustments to the deal terms before I signed the contract, so he told me he'd contact me when it was ready to be finalized. After my call with Evan... I drove to the studio to see what was up with Half. On the drive to Queens, I got an email that surprised me. It was Lindsay Lohan. She asked if I was in New York and said that I should come to a club in Manhattan later that night called Bungalow 8, where she'd be hanging out with a few of her girlfriends. So I hit her back and told her I'd meet her there. I had $20 in my pocket and zero in my personal account. I called my accountant, Artie Irk, and asked him to transfer $500 into my ATM account so I could have spending cash for the club. Mob Deep kept all our real money in a business account so we couldn't touch it. So when we wanted money, we'd make transfers through our account. It kept us from spending too much. Havoc wasn't at the studio, but our engineer Fly was there with Nice. I told Nice about Lindsay's invitation and asked him to come along. When 11 p.m. rolled around, we hopped in my bulletproof Suburban and stopped at the gas station to get gas plus some bread from the ATM. 
but when I checked my account, I still had zero. Sometimes the money transfers don't go through until the next day. Damn. I put 10 bucks in the bulletproof, enough to get there and back. Now I only had 10 bucks, and Nice had 20. Wow. We're going to an exclusive Manhattan club with 30 bucks to hang out with some million dollar white chicks. Oh well. At least we looking good. There were two black bouncers at the door who I figured might recognize me. What's up, man? It's Prodigy, I said. The bouncer looked at me like I was retarded. Are you on the guest list? He asked. It's a private party. I should be. Check it out. Prodigy from Marv Deep. Nah, I don't see you, the bouncer said after glancing at the list. Sorry. Yo, Prodigy, son. Marv Deep. It's just two of us. I hated feeling like I had to beg or prove that I belong in the club. Sorry, I can't let you in, he said, looking at me as if he couldn't care less. I'm here with Lindsay Lohan, I said. She's waiting for me. Who? Lindsay Lohan, I repeated. Can you please tell Lindsay that Prodigy's at the door? Thank you. The look on his face was priceless. Lindsay walked nice of me through the packed club to her VIP table where she had bottles of Grey Goose and Belvedere. Bungalow 8 looked like some tropical jungle type of shit inside. A predominantly white crowd sprinkled with blacks and Latinos. I've been there before with Alchemist. Lindsay's friends were wearing Mardi Gras looking white masks, drunk and dancing crazily to rap music. Lindsay introduced me to her assistant. We poured drinks and started dancing while Nice danced with one of the mysterious masked ladies. Another masked lady got behind Nice and had him in a sandwich. He looked over at me with the crazy Kool-Aid smile. After a handful of songs, Nice and I walked over to the bar so it wouldn't seem like we were drinking all of Lindsay's liquor. Prodigy? A young black bartender looked at me and asked. Oh, shit! My favorite rapper! Yo, I love Mob Deep, man. What can I get for you? Two shots of Hennessy on ice, I told him, since we were on a tight budget. Man, I'm hooking you up with a bottle, man, on the house. The bartender hooked us up. I thanked him for the bottle. He saved us from looking stupid and walked back to the VIP. On the way, I bumped into RZA from Wu-Tang Clan. We were surprised to see each other. Then I got back to Lindsay. The ladies poured shots of Hennessy and Knight started dancing with the same masked female. She lifted her mask real quick to get some air and I saw it was Ashley Simpson, Jessica Simpson's younger sister. I told Knight so he would know that he had a celeb on his hands. Then Lindsay pulled me back to her. I saw her looking at her Blackberry at the well and her mood changed. I asked her what was wrong and she said, this guy I used to mess with is fucking stalking me. I think he's in the club. Oh, yeah? Well, let me know if you see him and we'll fuck him up. I said, you good with me. I ain't letting nobody bother you if you don't want to be bothered. Just let me know. After another hour of drinking, dancing, and grinding on each other, we said our goodbyes. I don't know if Nice got Ashley's number, but regardless, we had fun that night. October 26, 2006. It was Alchemist's birthday, and twin, godfather, Ty Nitty, my cousin JM, JM's homeboy Rome, Alchemist, and I gathered at Al's Manhattan apartment to celebrate with a case of Heineken's, a case of Coronas, and a lot of Kush. Twin was pushing to go out, but Alchemist and I wanted to stay in the apartment and make music. Atlanta rapper Ludacris was having an album release party for his new singer, Sharifa, at the show nightclub near Times Square. Come on, yo. It's Alchemist's birthday, Twin said. Let's go out. We rolled out three cars deep. Alchemist and me in my bulletproof Suburban, JM and Rome 
and Jam's gold drop top SL Benz and twin Godfather and Ty Nitty in a black Hummer H2. I usually snuck a 2 2 or a 25 caliber handgun into the clubs if there were only a few of us. But there were seven of us, so I left the pistol in the truck in the storage box between the driver and the passenger seats. Velvet rope surrounded the club's front entrance. A black doorman came over. Yeah, what's up, man? Prodigy and Alchemist plus five, I announced. The doorman said to give him a minute. Then he walked inside the club. While waiting, I looked toward the street to my left and saw three plainclothes detectives from the hip-hop task force. I recognized them from the night they arrested me after the blood money release party at the Roxy. I didn't see the black cops. It was the white ones who looked like military dickheads. I wanted to point them out to Alchemist and Twin so they remember their faces. Yo, don't look right now. But over to the left, you're going to see three white dudes by a black car. I said, that's the hip-hop cops. The doorman came back with a young white woman who had a clipboard in her hand. What's up, guys? She said. We're working on clearing VIP tables for you now. How many is it? Seven? I got three tables, and there's a one bottle minimum per table. So you have to buy three bottles, okay? How much are the bottles? Alchemist asked. And what if we don't want to drink? You have to buy a bottle in order to get a table. It costs $400 a piece, the lady said. $1,200? Alchemist and I said in unison. To get into a party? Al and I looked at each other. I'm ready to bounce, $1, man. $1,200. They're trying to play us. The lady came back after a few minutes with another offer. It's really overcrowded in there, and we only have room for you guys in the VIP section, she said. So I could let you in, but you have to buy at least two bottles. That's only 800 Come on, I know you guys got that. Man, fuck this lame-ass party, Al said. Let's go. We jumped in our rides and rolled out with my Suburban leading the pack. Jam's Benz behind me and the Black Hummer behind them. A few blocks away, I got a call on my cell from JM. Yo, the D's just pulled me over, he said. Word? You clean, right? I asked. Yeah, yeah, we good, he said. Ain't nothing in here. Okay, well, call me back when they let you go, I said. We're going to stop and get some food. Alchemist wanted to stop at Pop Burger in the meatpacking district. I stood outside with Twin, Godfather, and Nitty to smoke a cigarette while Al ordered. Yo, your D's cut right in front of me to pull Jam over, Twin said. He doesn't have anything in the car, does he? Nah, he said he clean, I said. They cut in front of you to pull him over? That's strange. Alchemist came out with the food and bags, and we hopped back into my truck, heading towards his apartment. Twin, Nitty, and Godfather bounced back to QB. I called JM to see if he was okay. We good, son. They letting us go right now, JM said. Where y'all at? I told him to meet us at Al Crib. Alchemist and I stopped at a red light directly across the street from his building on 30th Street and 9th Avenue. While waiting for the light to change, I spotted an empty parking spot diagonally across the street from us in the middle of the block next to Al's building, which was like winning a lotto in Manhattan. So when the light turned green, I made an illegal U-turn up 9th Avenue and backed into the spot. Just as I was about to parallel park, a yellow cab with a six-watt tag at the top and a red flashing police light on the dashboard pulled in front of my truck. Damn, the gun squad. They must have been behind me at the red light, following us for some time. The squad was only after guns. They didn't care if you had weed, crack, dope, or any drugs, as long as they didn't find a gun. I knew I was going to get locked up. Fuck it, I thought. I beat it with illegal search. Two D's hopped out the cab. One approaching my side, 
and the other on Alchemist's side. Turn the vehicle off and put your hands in the air. I turned off the engine and complied. Another unmarked car pulled up behind us. Driver, roll down your window. Bulletproof windows only roll down four inches, enough to pay tolls and talk through. I rolled the window down as far as it went. The window doesn't come down any further because the truck is bulletproof, I told the cop. Unlock the door and step out the vehicle. I have to take off my seatbelt first, I said. I didn't want them to think I was reaching for a weapon. I stepped out the truck. The cops tried to open the door for me, a shocked look crossing on his face when he felt the weight of the 400-pound armored door. Alchemist got out, too. Do you have any weapons on you or in the car? The cop asked. No, I replied. They frisked us, ordering that we sit on the back of the bumper as they began searching my truck without permission. Two more plainclothes detectives stepped out of the unmarked black car behind my truck. J.M. and Rome pulled up in the bends looking at us, shaking their heads. J.M. parked and walked up next to us on the sidewalk. I was waiting for the moment the D's would find the gun. Any second now. 10-11, one of them yelled from inside the truck. They're cold for we found the gun. Stand up, turn around, and put your hands behind your fucking back, the two Ds from the second Omar car said, slapping on cuffs and searching us again, rougher this time. Yo, look across the street, Jam said. I saw a third unmarked car parked with Ds sitting low in the seats, watching. Those are the Ds that just pulled me over a little while ago, Jam said. Call my lady and tell her to call the lawyer, son, I told Jam. Call her now. Good looking. Keep it moving, the D's told Jam and Rome. Dad, get out of here. Walk up the block. They threw Alchemist and me in the yellow cab and brought us to the Midtown South Precinct on 35th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues, locking us in separate holding cells for the long hours of waiting. While sitting in my cell, one of the arresting officers brought me my bag of food from Pop Burger and my pack of Newports. You're not supposed to smoke, but I'm hooking you up, the detective told me. You didn't get it from me. A celebrity bus is a big deal for police. It might get him a nice promotion. Uniform officers came to my cell asking for autographs and pictures on their camera phones. Yo, Alchemist! I yelled through the cell bars after about an hour. Happy birthday! Yo, good looking! Al yelled back from a distance. You a funny motherfucker! The arresting officers pulled me out of my cell into an interrogation room. Look, we know the gun belongs to one of you, so just tell us. Whose gun is it? I don't know about no gun, I said. We do music. We don't use guns. Listen, we're willing to work with you. We'll forget about the gun and rip up the sheet if you're willing to give us some information. Do you know any drug dealers or criminals that you can help us bust? Any information at all? <laughs> Those D's were some real clowns. They continued. To tell you the truth, we just want information on 50 Cent. Does he buy drugs or guns? Maybe you can help us set up a buy and bust. Will he buy some drugs from you? I took a deliberate deep breath and exhaled real hard, putting my head in my hands to give them the impression that I was thinking about working with them. Oh, man. Can I get a cigarette? I asked. They fumbled in their pockets to find me a smoke. Between us, maybe you can drop a gun in 50's car 
and help us get them. One of the officers said, maybe some drugs. Does he let you get in any of his cars? You and your friend are going to get a lot of time, man. We're trying to help you get out of this situation. Nobody will ever find out that you helped us. Those crooked motherfuckers wanted me to plant a gun in Fifty's car. I smoked a cigarette fast and asked for another. So what's it going to be? One of the officers said, I'll rip up the arrest sheet right now, and we can act like this gun of yours never happened. He told his partner, go grab the sheet for him. The partner came back with the arrest sheet. Take it or leave it. What is going to be? Nah, if I got to do time, then so be it, I said, finishing my second cigarette. I'm not a rat. Back in my cell, I went to sleep on the hardwood bench, wondering if they were putting alchemists through the same thing. About an hour later, two different detectives took me back to the same room and tried the same bullshit, staring at me with hateful eyes. You know what? You fucking bastards make all this money while we make crumbs and our white women turn into groupies going to your shows and hotels, one detective said. His tone sounded like he wanted to hang me from a tree branch. I fucking hate that black rat bullshit. I know what you mean, officer, I said. It's crazy because not too long ago, We did a concert at Madison Square Garden, and I saw Nicole Kidman in the front row going crazy to our music. She loved rap. The officer's face turned blood red. Take this motherfucker back to his cell, he ordered his partner. Get him out my face. I lit my last cigarette in my cell and stood on the bench, scribbling on the ceiling with my lighter. Mob Deep, G-Unit. Infamous, HNIC Part 2, taking advantage of the time and the free advertising space. An hour or two later, the arresting officers took me upstairs into a conference room where a handful of agents were seated around the table, all wearing blue nylon jackets with the letters ATF printed on the back in yellow. Why don't we just do this? You write a statement and admit the gun is yours, so we can send your friend Alan home, one of the agents said, meaning alchemist, pushing the legal pad and pen towards me. I took the pad and pen and started writing. I slid the pad over to the ATF agent, who read it, then slammed the pad down and said, put him back in his cell. (laughs) The vague statement didn't offer any information they were looking for. They took me to a different holding cell, this time with Alchemist. I asked Al if he stuck to the script, and he confirmed that he did. I asked him if the D's were trying to get him to plant evidence on 50, and he said no. They just wanted him to confess that the gun was mine and not his. But Al kept telling them, I don't know about any gun. A transport van brought us to 100 Center Street, the tombs. Later that afternoon, the judge let Alchemist, who didn't have a criminal history, out without no bail and hit me with $50,000 bail. My lawyer, Irv Cohen, negotiated my bail down to $7,000 and 50 Cent put up the money. Around 5 p.m., Alchemist and I walked out of Central Booking and went straight to the G-Unit office so I could tell 50 how the gun squad and the ATF were trying to set him up. 50 was already highly aware how crooked law enforcement could be. My nigga, be careful about who you let inside your cars, office, house, and your hotel rooms, I told 50 in the conference room after detailing what happened. These police niggas is trying to set you up for real. The D's confiscated my bulletproof truck because of a New York state law that says if you're caught with guns or drugs in a vehicle that's in your name, if convicted, the state keeps your vehicle and auctions it off. I pleaded not guilty and was taking the case to trial. 
So I had to wait for the outcome of the trial to find out the fate of my truck. So I was back in my Porsche. I rode to a studio in an old warehouse in Bushwick, Brooklyn to listen to Beats by a production duo known as Sid Rome's, who Twin had been working with. Voxonic had agreed to my terms in the contract, and we were close to finalizing the deal. The owners of Vox, FD, was in his late 60s, and his son, R.E., was a few years older than me, had their main office in a $10 million brownstone that F.D. owned on 62nd Street and Lexington Avenue, down the block from my old high school, Art and Design. Voxonic had just inked a deal with Kamani Marley, one of Bob Marley's sons, who starred in the Jamaican underground cult classic movie, Shotters. Kamani's album was a month away from being released, so the office was filled with his promotional items. They were planning for him to go out on tour with Van Halen. The new year, 2007, came around, and my trial was set to begin at the end of February. My little cousin J.M. was in Laurelton, Queens, taking over the streets with Purple Haze weed. J.M. knew somebody who had $100,000 in counterfeit cash, the best fake money I'd ever seen. You're making a lot of money with this smoke. I told him. Don't start fucking around with that fake money. That's a federal charge. Nah, I'm not trying to get into that, J.M. assured me. My man gave me ten stacks because he owed me a favor. Aight, I said. Don't have the feds coming at you. The next day, J.M.'s mom's, my Aunt Janice, called saying that the D's ran in their house and found five pounds of weed two guns, and $5,000 in fake money, and confiscated both his drop tops, the SL Benz, and the Pontiac Solstice. His mother's front door was knocked off the hinges, hanging by a few screws when I went to visit him after he was bailed out. The feds came to talk to me at the precinct, J.M. told me, because they found 5000 in that funny money. They asked me, was I getting the money from you? What? I said, from me? They wanted to know who had the master die that created the money, J.M. explained. They said, who are you getting it from? Your cousin Prodigy out in New Jersey? How the hell do they know where I live? I said, they must have had our phones tapped. No wonder my phone been ringing crazy lately. What I was about to find out through my trial would confirm that my many years of paranoia was for good reason. My lawyer, Irv Cohen, insisted that I wear a suit to my trial. I didn't own any suits, so I bought an affordable brown suit from the men's warehouse. Kiki and I talked it over and decided not to bring the kids with us to court. I didn't lie to them about what was going on. I just didn't want them sitting through it. The first day of the trial in Supreme Court at 100 Center Street, the DA gave my lawyer and me an offer. Five years if I pleaded guilty. I was facing a maximum of 7 to 15 years because of my extensive criminal history. My lawyer and I asked for a postponement to have more time to get the case together. The judge granted us three months. The new trial date was set for June. At my lawyer's office in the Woolworth building by Ground Zero, a few days later, Irv introduced me to an older black gentleman with green eyes named Rodney. Rodney had been in the FBI for many years, the 14th black agent allowed into the bureau, and started his own private investigation company after retiring. Rodney and Irv had worked together on several cases. I explained step by step how my arrest took place, including how the same hip-hop task force arrested me the night of the blood money party at the Roxy. Both Irv and Rodney seemed to have a hard time believing that such a task force existed. I started working on HNIC Part 2 and snapped into full rebel mode. It's time to go the complete opposite direction in these other rappers, I decided, while they chased the luxurious life. 
I'm going to focus on the people in the hood and real life issues worldwide. I decided that my album wouldn't be for radio or TV because rap music was created for us to enjoy in the hood. We didn't go to the mainstream. It came to us. Men lie, women lie, and money allows you to lie even easier. But poverty doesn't lie. And Mob Deep represents poverty. My plan was to literally rage against the machine. The first batch of songs I recorded with Sid Rome's and Alchemist with Veterans Memorial 2, ABC, The Life, Young Veterans, Test 2 Babies, and Dirty New Yorker. I wanted to shoot a video for every song. I had a social networking site called HNIC2.com to help promote my album. With all the work I was cramming into every minute of every day, June zoomed around real fast, and it was about time for trial again. I met with Irv and Rodney for an update, and Rodney shared some interesting information that he discovered about the Hip Hop Task Force, which operated in conjunction with similar task forces in a few other states. Rodney had connected with a retired New York City detective who started the task force. Derek Parker. Derek invited Rodney to his house to discuss the history of the task force and my case. Derek explained how it all started when he was a regular uniform officer from Mount Vernon with a lot of friends in the music industry, including Puff Daddy and Heavy D. Derek's superiors wanted to start doing music industry surveillance, allowing him to pick his own team and design the task force promising a promotion to detective if he agreed. So Derek agreed. He soon realized that all the intel his superiors ordered him to gather was inconsequential and frivolous. What they were doing was illegal. So Derek quit. At Derek's house, he opened the treasure chest box and pulled out an entire file dedicated to Mob Deep. Ronnie flipped through tons of photos of us hanging out in Queensbridge, and coming in and out of clubs and studios, cars, and other random locations. Derrick told Rodney that they had been doing surveillance on us since 1993. Derrick went on to tell Rodney that after the investigations of Puff, Nas, Tupac, Wu-Tang, and Marv Deep, his superiors wanted him to expand the intel, putting further funding into the covert operation to follow more rappers, names, addresses, friends, enemies, families, hangouts, and more. Derek Parker had enough. When he quit, he authored a book titled Notorious C.O.P., exposing all the wrongs that were taking place. As Rodney explained all this incredible information to Irv and me, my thoughts drifted off for a moment. This shit reminds me of Cointel Pro and the Black Panthers always suspected we were being monitored, but this shit is more serious than I thought. Rodney told us that Derek Parker had agreed to testify on a stand in my trial about how the task force uses illegal searches to make gun arrests. Derek knew this all too well because he created the tactic. Alchemist was my only witness to the illegal search and also agreed to testify at a hearing to suppress the gun evidence. The D's didn't have my permission or a search warrant to go into the box where the gun was located. So the judge would have to toss the evidence out. To make our case stronger, Rodney was trying to link the D's who arrested us to the hip-hop task force. Alchemist told the whole story from when the D's followed us from the club to when the other D's in the 6 Y yellow cab illegally searched my truck. The DA quickly objected to the followed us from the club part and the judge agreed that that part wasn't relevant to the case. The judge only wanted to know about what happened from the moment of my legal U-turn up until the D's found the gun. My lawyer Irv tried to tell the judge that the entire story was relevant but the judge wasn't trying to hear that. After Alchemist, they called one of the D's to the stand, the one who brought my food and cigarettes to my cell that night. The judge ruled that the gun evidence could come in at trial. 
On September 19th, Havoc had an album release party for the solo album he'd been quietly working on, The Kush, at SOB's in downtown Manhattan by the Highland Tunnel. Hot 97 promoted the event. About 20 of us rolled that night, so I wasn't concerned with bringing guns, but brought a little knife with a razor for a blade. I loved that little thing. It was small, but it could cause severe damage. At SOB's, after talking with rapper J. Rue the Damager, who had a few underground hits in the early 90s, but has since disappeared from the scene, we went downstairs to the dressing room until DJ Premier announced his new group, NYG's. Before NYG's gets on stage, we got a special guest who just walked in and asked to perform, Premier said. Saigon, come up to the stage. We all looked at each other at the same time and said, Saigon? Fuck that, let's go fuck this nigga up, Havoc said. Come on. Ten of us stayed in the crowd, and ten of us went up on stage and surrounded Saigon from behind, who was with two of his boys and one bodyguard. I opened the knife and held it concealed in my jacket pocket. I got a good look at all the video cameras in the crowd, and I thought to myself, don't do anything that's going to incriminate you. You on camera. Remember, you on trial. Saigon was caught up in his performance and didn't realize we were behind him. Havoc, tipsy, was about to pounce on Saigon. But as Haz stepped forward to snuff him, I grabbed Hav. Chill, son, not like this, I said. Let anybody else get him. Then Hav walked up to Saigon while he was rapping and said something in his ear while the music kept playing. Saigon stopped rapping, had a quick conversation with Hav, then they gave each other a pound and hug, and I overheard Saigon say, I love y'all niggas, man. As soon as Saigon put the mic down to walk off stage, my boy Tyson grabbed him by the back of his shirt and pushed him in the Unpacino, Nice and Wop by the stage exit. They beat Saigon and kicked him under the DJ table where he hid for a moment before climbing up to hide behind his bodyguard. Peeking his head out from behind his bodyguard, he saw me standing there looking for him. Then he reached out and threw a punch at me. I leaned back and caught the tail end of the punch to the side of my head, knocking my fitted hat off. Then he threw another swing with the same hand and he missed me. As I was leaning back to avoid the last swing, one of his boys tried to clothesline me, but hit me in my left shoulder, knocking me to the ground. Then he jumped off the stage and ran out the club, leaving Saigon for dead. Luckily, I didn't stab myself with that open knife in my pocket. My man Fly chased that kid and beat him up bad outside. Saigon hid in the corner behind his bodyguard as our crew launched bottles and glasses at him, hitting the wall just inches from his face. My boys had him and his bodyguard trapped in the corner now. Fearing for his life, Saigon's bodyguard gave him a piggyback ride, jumping off the stage wearing Saigon like a backpack. With 15 of my niggas chasing him, they ran out of the club top speed. You see... That's why black people can't never have nothing. Havoc grabbed the mic and shouted. Can't we all just get along? Then I grabbed the other mic and shouted. You see who just got beat up and ran out of here, right? Hey, yo, DJ on point, start the music. While we performed Shook Ones, Um Pacino, Nice, Fly, and the crew were outside chasing Saigon through the streets as he ran into oncoming traffic, dodging speeding cars. Drop your jewelry and we'll stop chasing you, Um Pacino shouted. Drop your jewelry, nigga. While running, Saigon took off his watch and tossed it behind him. Then, Saigon and his boys hopped into their car service and peeled off. I watched it all on my cameraman Jordan's footage after the show and told him to post it up on YouTube immediately. Jordan wanted to edit out the part where I got punched and knocked down. But I told him to just post the entire thing. I ain't give a fuck. 
Anybody can get hit. Shit, you can punch the president if you get close enough. It's all about what's going to happen to you after you do that dumb shit. The next night, Havoc had another album release party at another Manhattan club. My man Baja, a graphic artist, designed a flyer with a silhouette of a man running that read, Run, Saigon, run. I had 3,000 double-sided flyers printed at Kinko's to scatter throughout the streets of Manhattan before the party. Smoking weed and drinking backstage, Tyson told me, Pete, put out the weed, hurry up, hurry up. The D's are coming in the dressing room. They want to talk to you. Two detectives, one black, one white, walked in. Where's Prodigy? The black one asked. What's up, man? I asked, standing up. Is everything all right? Listen. Don't worry, he said. I don't care if you're smoking back here. I came to talk to you about last night. We know what happened. And we don't care if you guys beat people up and fight and all that. We just don't want you guys to start shooting people. Shooting? No, we don't get into all that, I said. We just do music. We just rappers. Yeah, yeah, okay, he said. Seriously, this guy Saigon. Is it over or what? We don't want anything to happen to him. Yeah, we don't got no problems with him, I said. A little fight happened in that day. All right. Good luck with your court case, he said. You guys have a good night. Whoa. Sounded like Saigon was working with the D's. On November 2nd, 2007, I turned 33. It was a monumental day for my woman Kiki and me because we flew to Los Angeles and decided to finally get married. Neither of us believed in the European religions based on the Holy Bible, nor did we believe in the marriage rituals or ceremonies, but we decided to do it mostly for legal reasons. We stayed at Alchemist's beachfront condo in Venice Beach for a couple of days. I reached out to 40 Glock to arrange to shoot some videos with a director named Ken X. On November 4th, Kiki and I flew to Vegas to get married because it only took 30 minutes to get a marriage license out there. We went to the Little White Chapel and performed a ceremony with 40 Glock and my man African Rob as our witnesses. It felt great to be husband and wife. We had a roller coaster relationship for 13 years and agreed to leave all our mistakes in the past and stay together. Kiki was a strong, loving woman to stay with me through it all. So she deserved all the respect in the world from me. We spent the night in the Wynn Hotel and Casino and popped champagne. Back in New York, it was time for the jury selection. The DA was a young Italian man and his assistant was an Asian man, both in their early 30s. The jurors, who they brought in to select from, were 95% white, only four blacks, and all four told the judge that they couldn't make a proper decision because they claimed to have family who were hurt by gun violence. Most of the time, when jurors say that to a judge, they're just trying to get out of doing jury duty. Blacks and Latinos need our people on the juries to help decide the fate of our trials and for the trials to actually be fair. The four black jurors were relieved of their duties, and there were only whites left to select from. Irv and I had to base our selections on which ones we thought would not make a biased decision. I looked in their eyes, listened to them speak, and hoped we chose wisely. The prosecution called the two detectives who arrested me. After swearing in with hands on the Bible, the second detective began. His testimony was on point until he said, And when we approached Mr. Johnson's vehicle, I saw a nickel-plated gun in his hand. He was trying to put it away in a box so we wouldn't see it. I shot him and looked like he was out of his fucking mind. I knew I was going to lose the trial after that testimony. Irv questioned both the detectives about the other unmarked car that pulled up seconds after them. 
How did they know to come to the location of my truck? It was just a coincidence, the arrest and deeds responded. They just so happened to be driving past and stopped to help us. We didn't call them. There was no way for us to prove that they were profiling, and I was in a bad position. If I continued with the trial and left it up to the jury, whose side would they believe? Alchemists or two New York City detectives who claimed they saw a gun in my hand? The DA went into the hallway and rolled the TV and DVD player into the courtroom, perhaps to play my Mac-10 handle and infamous Allegiance DVD for the jury to make me look like a menace to society. There were a lot of guns and violence in those videos. Maybe it was a scare tactic, but it worked. Along with the lies from the detectives, I knew I couldn't win this one. We took a lunch break, and the DA stepped to Irv and offered him a new deal. Three and a half years in prison, as opposed to the original five years. But only if I accepted the offer within 24 hours. Staring out at the Hudson River and Giant Stadium that night in my backyard, I contemplated my next move. Do you want to see your kids when they're in their 20s or in three years? I asked myself. Do you want to come back in three short years and still have a career or be gone for so long that your music doesn't matter to the world anymore? I called my mom's brother, Havoc, 50, and a gang of others to see how they felt about my choices. They all wanted me to fight. I felt like an asshole for not listening to 50 when he told me to put surveillance cameras in my truck. That footage would have proved everything. I had beaten many cases and avoided prison by the skin of my teeth for many years. You can't win them all, I told myself. Take the three and a half years, come out smarter, stronger, and better than ever. Then came the hard part. I had to go inside the house and explain to my kids what was about to happen. Most parents might hide that from their 11-year-old son and 9-year-old daughter. But I gave my kids the real, all the time. I told my son first. But you're not a bad person, Shaka said, dropping a few tears. You just carry a gun for protection. You don't run around hurting people. Yeah, but that gun was illegal, I said. I broke the law by having an illegal gun in my truck. I should have gotten a gun license or a bodyguard, but I didn't. So now I have to pay for my mistakes. Shaka understood clearly, but he couldn't hold back the tears. I was proud of him for being strong, though. Three years goes by fast, kid. Remember when we were on tour together with 50 and Eminem? Well, in two months, that'd be three years ago. See how fast that went? It seemed like yesterday, don't it? He agreed. We both went into my bedroom, and I explained the same to my daughter, Tasia. Tasia took it well also. I don't even think she cried. Maybe while I wasn't looking. After breaking the news to my little ones, I confirmed my decision with my lawyer, Irv, and got right down to business. If I was going to prison for three and a half years... I needed to leave enough product in the streets to keep my name alive until I got back. I hadn't even signed a deal with Voxana yet. I walked into the court the next morning, early, with my wife Kiki and my lawyer Irv. Our plan was to accept a three and a half year deal by pleading guilty and to ask the judge for another three month extension on sentencing so I could work on my health, finish my album, and do a promo tour before doing my time. The judge granted the three months. Time was limited, so I started knocking songs and videos out fast, planning the promo tour, and filming myself every day, uploading the most infamous.com with footage until I started my sentence. I was racing the clock like a madman. 
Jerry Lamont, the writer and director of Blackout, called me and invited me to the movie premiere on West 23rd Street in Manhattan. I brought Kiki, Draws, Sam Scarfo, and Scientific. The theater was packed with press, celebrities, and movie industry people. After the premiere, Quincy Jones' son, QD3, called and asked me to star in a new documentary about rappers and guns that he was filming. The Alchemist got a call about using a song from HNIC Part 2 for the popular video game Grand Theft Auto. We decided to give them Dirty New Yorker. Peter Keys, my HNIC 2 distributor and manufacturer, told me that the MP3 player company Sansa wanted me to promote their new MP3 device in exchange for $200,000 in marketing and promotion of HNIC Part 2. My head was spinning. My plate was full of things to accomplish in such a limited amount of time. After a quick East Coast promo tour, my last performance before turning myself in was at B.B. King Blues Club in Times Square. Kiki and I arrived early to knock out a bunch of press interviews before the show. Backstage, my guests started arriving. Twin, Godfather, Ty Nitty, Gotti, Chinky, Tyson, Umpacino, Maserati Fox, even Bars and Hooks popped up. I hadn't seen them in years. Cormega, Noid, and a bunch of 50s boys from G-Unit. The club was packed. The only people missing were Havoc and my man Fly, who eventually showed up 20 minutes before showtime. After performing a bunch of HNIC Part 2 songs, Havoc, drunk and tired of waiting, got on the mic and demanded that we do our Mob Deep songs. I wasn't planning to do Mob Deep songs until after my solo set, but once again, I didn't want to look like Havoc and I weren't on the same page, because that's a sign of weakness so I decided to go with the flow. The show sequence was a little sloppy, but we still killed it. The entire performance was professionally filmed, so I could release it on DVD. It was an emotional night for me. Even though I didn't show it on my face, Kiki and I got home, and I felt like the world was off of my back. I was ready to get the time ahead of me over with, so I could come back to my family and the world as a brand new man. 50 came to my crib that weekend for the first time. We weren't expecting him. The kids were excited to see him. We showed him around our place, and he told me not to stress, and asked me if I could help him write a screenplay for one of his G-Unit books titled Ski Mask Way. Murder Music was one of 50's favorite hood films, and he always complimented me on the way I wrote the story. Then we spoke about Havoc, and how I had recently found out that Bob Perry from Koch Records was illegally selling Mob Deep music on the internet and in stores. Bob put out an album, Infamous Archives, without our permission, and we were planning on suing him. 50 agreed to back us and make sure we had a strong case. The day had come. February 29th, 2008. It was time for my sentencing hearing. Kiki and I woke up early. I planned ahead and found out what I was allowed to wear in Rikers Island. I wore a dark gray sweatsuit, dark gray scully, two fresh white t-shirts, two pairs of socks, black shell toe Adidas, and thermal underwear so I wouldn't be cold. I cut tiny holes in the cuffs and bottom elastic of the sweatshirt, stuffing as many little morphine pills as possible inside the holes just in case I got sick. I wasn't trying to suffer from pain inside of a prison cage. Kiki filmed me on the drive to Manhattan Supreme Court. One last piece of footage for the most infamous dot com. Huh. Before I went in, when we arrived at court, all my boys were waiting out front. Alchemist, Havoc, Umpacino, Tyson, Gotti, Chinky, Nice, Fly, and a few others. Press cameras snapped pictures as we walked towards the courthouse entrance. Good luck, prodigy, a white cameraman yelled out. Take care of yourself. We see you when you get home. 
The crew walked inside and took the elevator to the courtroom on the 14th floor. Irv was waiting in the hallway. You ready, kid? He asked. Yeah, let's get this shit over with. I said. I gave Kiki one last kiss and hug, and then walked into the courtroom. The court clerk called my name. I walked to the defendant table to be sentenced by the judge. The court officers cuffed my wrist and led me to a back room. I turned around to get one last look at my wife, Kiki. Sadness spread across her face. October 3rd, 2009. Mid-State Correctional Facility. Marcy, New York. 9 a.m. Taking an early morning spin around the pebble line yard before my daily workout routine was my favorite thing to do in prison. It was my escape from the trivial inmate conversations and annoying noise and chatter that constantly came out to see those walkie-talkies. It was peaceful. Dirt and pebbles crunching under my sneakers as I walked at a calm pace. The leaves of the tall trees rustling in the wind birds chirping, and my inner voice reminded me how lucky I was to have had so many chances to get my life together. You better know that after this, your chances are done. If you don't get out there and stick to the script, the rest of your life will be nothing but pain, sorrow, and regret, I told myself. As I strolled around the dusty path, I kept thinking about this book, Evolution of a Revolutionary, an autobiography of Tupac's mom, Afeni Shakur, written by Jasmine Guy. Afeni said something in that book that made me realize why I kept fucking up even though I was trying to live righteous all those years. She explained that the Black Panther Party she had been a part of had overwhelming power mentally and physically some of the smartest, toughest brothers and sisters ever. They created an incredible amount of positive change in the black communities worldwide, even inspiring other oppressed races to stand up and fight for equality. But the Panthers' lack of spiritual power, or God in their movement, was a major reason behind their downfall. Afeni didn't say it like that exactly, but that's exactly what she meant and I could relate 100%. I had the mental and physical strength to do a lot of good things in life and had a lot of real good success. But I didn't have the spiritual power of God that it takes to do great things. Ever since I was a teenager, I tell people, I'm a spiritual person, but I don't believe in God. I was too young-minded to realize that that was a hypocritical statement. See, always looked at things from a scientific point of view. So believing something to be true doesn't mean it's actually the truth. But when you know something is true, that's when you're sure and it's a fact. In other words, I didn't want faith in God. I wanted God in fact. I was looking for God all over the place. In my prayers when I was young. In the hospital when I was in tremendous pain in books, up in the sky, and in my questions to my father. Is there God? I asked Pops. Yes, he answered. How do you know that God is real? I've seen God before, he said. If you've seen God, then what did God look like? God looks like water. Water? Yeah, Pops said. God looks like water. God is everywhere and everything. Once I officially acknowledged that God has always been and always will be in my life, it gave me the power to handle any situation. It put my anger in check and taught me to approach problems as lessons. Nothing is a challenge to me anymore, just an experience. I don't compete anymore. I just create. There's no such thing as opposition. It's just nature at work. H&IC Part 2 
was released on April 22nd, 2008, about two months after I went in. It was a commercial failure, selling just over 60,000 units. To be honest, I wasn't upset, because the main reason I released that album was for my family to have the advance, salary, and mortgage payment money while I was in prison. I was aware that the company wasn't capable of pushing my album to its maximum sales potential without me being able to properly promote it. It had nothing to do with the economy, changing trends in the music industry, or my ability to create quality songs. That company just didn't know what to do without me, so they dropped the ball. About nine months into my bid, Voxonic was so furious that they had to pay my wife $10,000 a month after I gotten locked up that they stopped paying her and answering her calls. Wow. They're the ones that agreed to my terms. But I put that album and that company out of my mind and focused on the songs that I was creating now. The only things that really matter in life are the things that need to be taken care of right now. As a matter of fact, these are the most important words of wisdom in this book. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow doesn't count unless you take care of your priorities right now. 50 Cent had came to visit me soon after New Year's 2009. He came alone. The whole prison was talking about the visit. In the visitor's room, the COs had to tell inmates and their visitors to fall back and stop asking for autographs. We spoke for an hour and a half about his film company, Cheetah Vision, and the movie he wrote for his album, Before I Self-Destruct. He said he named the character, who's his little brother in the film, after my son, Shaka. 50 had FedEx Shaka $1,000 cash as a Christmas gift. Shaka was 13 and a full-blown skateboarder who wanted to go pro. So he bought a bunch of skate gear with his gift money. 50 told me he was looking forward to my return so we can get started on the next Mall Deep album. We had a real good visit. Johnson! A CEO woke me up at around 11 a.m. on a Saturday, just after 2010 New Year, and announced, Visit! When I arrived at the visiting building, a big smile spread across my face when I saw Havoc sitting alone, sipping on a cup of coffee. Wow. Finally, he came. Yo, forgive me for not visiting and writing you back like I should, Hav said after a handshake and a hug. There's no excuse for it, man. Listen, I just want to communicate more so we can continue to be successful with Mob Deep, I said. I can't lie. I sit in my cell mad as hell at you, wondering why don't you want to talk? But no matter how mad I get, I always come to the same conclusion. Mob Deep is more important than both of our personal feelings toward each other. We still have a business to run. Nah, it's not like that, Ash said. You know I love you like my own brother. I just have a hard time writing letters, and there's no excuse why I don't visit more. Have. I know you mad at me for getting locked up and messing up our money flow. And I apologize for that, I said. You used to tell me all the time to stop carrying guns and getting into trouble. Man, I used to be scared to get in the car with you because you always had a gun, Hav said. I'm done with all that now. And I've written seven albums in here so far. I've been wanting to talk to you about music and our plans. Yo, the industry is real different now. Even big-time R&B artists is only selling a few hundred thousand units, Hav said. It's tough. Rap music still selling millions of copies, I reminded Hav. Just look at Lil Wayne, Jay-Z, T.I., Eminem. We just have to make incredible music. Not just, oh, that's hardcore, but, yo, that's incredible. We can't allow industry sales to fuck with our confidence. Don't ever forget that Mob Deep is something special. All we have to do is keep going. Yo, you should visit Lil Wayne while he's in Rikers. Wayne and I have been writing each other. That nigga love us, man. 
He's a good dude. I saw him in Manhattan before I turned myself in, and he told me he wanted beats from you. Even Alchemist got a beat on Carter 3. You should have been on that album. I, right, I'm going to try to get over there. Did you hear the beat I did on 50's new album? Have ass. Yeah, that shit is hard. I like it. I heard you got something on Eminem and Kanye's albums. Don't slow down. You need to do more production for other artists. People love your beats, man. Havoc just wasn't good at networking in the business world. Why a person would want to turn down so much money, opportunity, and great relationships is beyond me. I'll never understand Havoc. He's a mystery. Probably the eighth wonder of the world. But I still love him. You know me, Pete. I don't like being around people, Hav said. I don't hang out at the G-Unit office because I'm not good with that networking shit. That's what you do. You think 50 want to release another Mob Deep album? There's a rumor on the internet saying he dropped us from the label. That's just a rumor. We just got to do our part and create great music like we always do. Yo, I ain't drink alcohol in two years, I have said. Today actually makes two years. Wow, keep it up, man. I was really proud of him. We got to be more focused than ever before. You know how many people want to see us fall off? If it's hard for artists to sell units right now, well, that's too bad for them. We in a class of our own. That attitude brought us this far. The moment that you forget that, you finish. And that's when I'm going to be forced to keep it moving on you. <laughs> Havoc laughed, but he knew I was serious. See, that's the motivation I've been missing since you've been away, Hav said. You got me hyped now. I was a little nervous about coming up here at first. I couldn't even sleep last night. That's why I'm drinking all this damn coffee. I had like three cups already. Nigga, this is how we feed our families. The bottom line for me was always our business and our music, I said. I know, Hav said. Another 30 minutes passed and we said our goodbyes. I told Hav to make sure he sent me some beats, and he said he would. In my cell, I sat on my paper-thin mattress, thinking about how far Havoc and I had come. All the songs we wrote and recorded, all those beats, tours, parties, after parties, groupies, videos, interviews, contracts, labels, lawyers, and offices. All the money we made, spent, shared, wasted, and given away to so-called friends. Prison gave me plenty of time to reflect. In the street, I didn't think, I just did. After Havoc's visit, my spirit was at ease. I thought about how other people could inspire you to feel and do better. Havoc inspired me to allow forgiveness. Nas inspired me to prove people wrong. He told Twin I was corny back when I battled him, and I had forgiven him a few times. Hopefully, he could do the same for me. Even Jay-Z was a huge inspiration in my life as far as how he carried himself and conducted his business. The problems that we all had with each other was just petty street bravado. We're all a special breed of black men. New York rappers with a gift. We reached millions of people around the world who talk, dress, and act just like us. I'm sure there'll be plenty of newcomers filling our shoes when we've officially played out. I wish everybody wellness, Love, peace, and happiness. And I laugh at anybody who thinks there's something soft about that. <laughs> you got a lot of growing up to do. I went through the same thing. Acknowledgements. 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 A great number of people inspired me to write this book. Directly as well as indirectly. From my family and friends to people I look up to who don't even know me. I appreciate them all and hope they too will find some type of inspiration within these pages, my life, and my music. This body of work, along with other goals I've reached, was accomplished while keeping all of them in mind and with their assistance. 
though they may not even know it. I want to show my sincere appreciation for those who helped make this book possible. So I must pay my respect forward. The creator and life force that most know as God. Without the grace and power of God, nothing would be. My loving mother for teaching me about love, peace, and happiness, and for being patient through my juvenile BS as a young kid. My brother, Greg, for being a true big bro, always taking care of me and making me laugh, even in times when I was in tremendous pain and it hurt to do so. And my niece, Kanisha, and nephew, Kenny. My nana, Miss Bernie Johnson, who would have proudly displayed this book on her coffee table along with her collection of jet magazines. My father, Little Bud, for teaching me about mental and physical strength and fearlessness. My grandfather, Big Bud, for teaching me about discipline, hard work, and determination through the example of his own successful music career. My grandmother, the no-nonsense Bernice H.N.I.C. Johnson, who schooled me constantly on business and an entrepreneurial way of thinking, money management, and being proud of my black culture. Her name and legacy will live forever. Uncle Lenny and Aunt Connie, both of whom have bailed me out and given me shelter in times of need and that little bit of cushion to absorb my hard falls. Miss Cookie, my wife's mother, for accepting me into the family. My friend, the boss, 50 Cent, and his staff at G-Unit for opening up several new doors of opportunity for me and introducing me to Dr. Michael Diamond, who is now my nutritionist. It was Dr. Diamond who made the proper connections for me to become a published author. Thanks to my literary agent, the one and only David Vigliano, as well as Michael Harriet for his help in the early stages. David Peak and Laura Checkaway, my new partner and scribe. Without her expert knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of Mob Deep, prodigy, and the unique culture of hip-hop, this autobiography would not have been turned in and released to the world on time. This gracious young woman has gone the extra hundred miles because she knows the importance of this story. Laura has taught me a lot about this craft. Also, Laura's team, Abby Addis, Shauna Barboza, and John Pegg III for their contributions. John Baselli, Peter Keys, and wife, Miss J. Keys. The entire Simon & Schuster Touchstone staff, publisher Stacy Kramer, editor-in-chief Trish Todd, associate publisher David Falk, marketing manager Meredith Kernan, my publicist Shida Carr, and especially my editor Sule Hernandez for realizing the value within my life story and helping this book actually get into readers' hands. My brother from another mother, the Don from way beyond, Havoc, and all his crimes for choosing me as a friend and partner instead of a larceny victim when we first met. <laughs> Otherwise, the world would have never had Marv Deep. We balance each other out like yin and yang. Our life is a never-ending studio session, and as always, we'll make the best out of it. And with thanks to Havoc's mother, Miss Mercedes, this beautiful woman took me in as a son and put up with our loud noise as we were mastering our art. Rest in peace to Miss Aisha. Steve Rifkin and Maddie C. All I can say is, wow, I love those guys. Chris Lighty, for all his assistance and his calm, level-headed approach to business from which I learned a great deal. My West Coast family, Alchemist, Ice-T, Neil Diamonds, Evidence, Sid Rome's, Block, Big Bad 40, and African Rob. These brothers held me down when I had no one else to turn to. Can't forget Marvis Johnson, Sam Scarfo, Fly, Jake One, Kerry Edge and the Edge family, Roger Jeffrey and the Jeffrey family, Bones Malone, 
Chris Blackwell, Cookie Gonzalez, Barry Weiss, Lord Nez, T Dubs, Tyson, Un Pacino, SC, and King Benny. My attorneys, Irv Cohen, Ball Kalina, Jack Reynolds, Londell McMillan, and Evan Fifeld for their advice, time, and consideration. My accountant, Artie Irk, for all the tough love he's given Mob Deep when it came to our finances. Dan the Man Melamid, Stretch Armstrong and Bobito, Peter Oasis, Domingo Neris, The Loud Staff, Puerto Rican Rob Hernandez, Chef Lowe, Gabby, Nelson, Dan Tanner, Chris Green, Ola Kudu, Scott Free, Buddha, Frank V, OJ, and the Lao Street team from east to west. Comb, Judd, Kirk, Erica, Teresa, Chris Mack, Seth, Sean C, Liz, Rich Isaacson, John Rifkin, Jill Bivens, Gerard Hunt, Jeff, Jordan, Noah, Akio, Che Harris, Randy Roberts, Sanchez, Brandon, and Shane Mooney, the Violator staff, Ice, Mike Lighty, Laura Dobbins, Claudine Joseph, the G Unit staff, Renee, Jeremy, Nikki Martin, Alvon, Broadway, and Who Kid. All the radio stations across the country and overseas that supported us throughout the years. Special shout out to Tim Westwood, Mark Wahlberg, Adrian Brody, Jamie Foxx, Rick Gonzalez, Hassan Johnson, and Nicole Kidman. Thanks for appreciating Mob Deep's music. The journalists, photographers, and video directors who have captured memorable Mob Deep moments through the years. All the concert promoters around the world. I want to give a special thank you to all the supporters, fanatics, and straight-up hip-hop junkies. Without you, there's no reason to do what I do. Come with me on a trip to a place you can get anything that you want, anything that you wish. It's a place kept secret and on the low. You just got to know somebody, yo. With me, you good to go. Welcome to the next level, we your dreams fulfilled, things is real, diamonds, pearls, precious stones and metals, it's your world, laid back on the beach, laid back at the spa, laid back at the hotel suite with a jar, that smelly green plant, let's go crib and car shopping, just like that, you in the new bins, condos in Rome, Egypt, Paris, got you falling in love with all this lavish, lifestyle living, five star resorts and private planes that change your whole vision, cool into a new world, you gotta keep it to yourself, don't go and tell the other side when life is real easy and everything you wish is at your fingertips, girl, come with me to another world, you gotta keep it to yourself, don't go and tell the other side when life is real easy and everything you wish is at your fingertips, girl, with you see DR and DNG shades now you see the world different, you trying new things, thinking new thoughts feel a new high, new buzz forget what you used to love, you get you a taste of power in 24 hours service, no stress pending, just bread spending, 50 thou out in Vegas, yeah, we don't care if we lose, we like the atmosphere, let's try Dubai, and a little Brazil, scuba, jet ski, baby, get your thrills, in New York, we can hum a stunt, in the drop, hum a one, take a ride through the boroughs if you want, and make them all jelly, my stash box get fit, two carbines in the Mac get they front, we can buy the whole hood, and lower the rent, and buy the whole Macy's, so we can look good doing it, cool me to another world, you gotta keep it to yourself, don't go and tell the other side when life is real easy. And everything you wish is at your fingertips. Girl, come with me to another world. You gotta keep it to yourself, don't go and tell the other side when life is real easy. And everything you wish is at your fingertips. I like that, I like that. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You get two of those. You get, you get, Man, I'm big time, yeah, it's big P, 
Dollar after dollar, money growing like a tree. Better yet, the forest. P got the retardist. Maniac rapper from New York with the hardest. Endless, 16 balls and 12 balls. I rap about my life and not about yours. You might can relate though. You wish. So check me out, son. Check me out over here. I just bought a Seattle 600 bands. 20 inch rims, looking real fresh. The Ferrari got the manual automatic switch, but. CL 600 bands, 20 inch rims, looking real fresh. Turbo pulse with the six speed shift buttons. Fucking right. I stop at the light, everybody stares. Hand on my gun, you don't see it, but it's dead. Think it's all a game, think it's a mirage. Get that ass lit like fire on the logs. I got endless drama. Young boy, you a flea. I step on your head when I step out the V. Crazy, icy on the wrist, but. <laughs> CL 600 bands, 20 inch rims. Looking real fresh. The Ferrari got the manual automatic switch, but. CL 600 bands, 20 inch rims, looking real fresh. Turbo Porsche with the six speed shift buttons. Yeah, 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 you know. uh -huh, uh -huh. CL 600 Mercedes bands, 20 inch rims, stunning on my lady friends. Shorty kick it back and enjoy the trip. We going on a ride, we flying the whips. Chrome doves with the jet black lips. Little kids sit and call it the spaceship. David on my neck, and Gabriel gave me this, but <laughs> What, nigga, CL 600 bands, 20 inch rims, looking real fresh The Ferrari got the manual automatic switch, but Just bought a CL 600 bands, 20 inch rims, looking real fresh Turbo pulse with the six speed shift, but CL 600 bands, 20 inch rims, looking real fresh. Turbo pulse with the six speed shift button. Uh, stronger than ever. I'm back, nigga. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Listen. New York is just one crumb on the map. One crumb ain't a lot. You happy with that piece? I'm gonna need that pie to satisfy my thirst. Pacify my greed for blood, money, and power. The fans turn me to a monster. Addicted to when they scream, you had one hit in your life. One second of fame. One of you niggas act up. Everybody pays, all of you niggas back up, or I'ma start spraying. It's the ring around the rollin', pocket full of old men, ashes to ashes, all my fallen soldiers. Reminds me to bring my gun, bring my blade, kills niggas on contact. Just like Ray, you can't find P. I'm MIA, I went MIA, drinking wet willies. This is global dominance. You on some block shit, I'm in the UK Turning apples to oranges It's pig against the world I don't think y'all niggas hear me though, man nope. Y'all hear me It's pig against the world But I'm supposed to be scared I got machines too, nigga, big ones It's pig against the world Nigga, I just bought four plastic rocket launchers, nigga It's just pig against the world. 40, tell him I need some more rockets off the internet. I finna burn this fucker down. It's pig against the world. You want war? I take you to war. Listen, I'm giving you one piece of my mind, one piece at a time. If you could read my thoughts, you would say that I'm a terrorist and label me a threat to the world. Cause I influence all your little boys and your girls to stand up and make a difference. Just watch me, take advantage of my freedom of speech. They can't stop me, they wanna lock me in Guantanamo Bay. But my pricey lawyer are just chew through the case, plus my fans would riot. Man, it would be a state of emergency with t-shirts that read free P. You need me so you can point your fucking fingers and say, Did the bad guy goes? You're all a bunch of fucking assholes. Over my dick, jump off of my shit, do whatever it is you do. And I'ma keep it popping, making hits for the new black kids in the hood. We don't agree with the system. Nah, fuck them all. It's big against the world. Yeah, that's right. It's not all good, nigga. Bitch ass nigga. Go be friends with somebody else. It's just big against the world. Fuck out of here. You bother me. It's big against the world. Hey, yo, Bush, fuck you, nigga. Fuck your whole bloodline. It's big against the world. Yeah, I know you heard that. And it's what? Just big. They can't take it, son. They don't understand me. Pig against the world. Feel me, for they kill me. It's just pig. Yeah. Feel me, for they kill me, nigga. It's just me against the world. And that's what it is, man. That's what it is, man. Thank you. Fuck all y'all. Thank you very much. I like to thank all y'all for hating so hard. Oh yeah. Like to thank all y'all. Give it up, give it up. Not believing in me. Thank you very much, man. Give it up, give it up. Give it up for yourself. Stand up, give your own self a round of applause. Matter of fact, stand up, broke ass niggas, man. Thank all you rich motherfuckers, man. Whatever, man. Go buy my shit, nigga. Download the shit, man. Know what I'm saying? Capital P, VIP, man. Don't make me no difference, nigga. Yeah, nigga. Know what I'm saying? I'm rich, baby. Hey, yo, call fifth, man. Let's take a ride in the yacht or something, man. Call to him, man. Let's burn it down. Hey, yo, H, good looking, nigga. I love you.